Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit. I'm here with Sam Bankman-Fried. Sam, thank you so much for joining me. He's the co-founder and CEO of FTX, as well as the precursor and predecessor, Alameda Research. So thanks so much, Sam. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, this is pretty interesting, first of all, because I typically have people that I usually ask where they're located, but you, uh, we actually had a, a quite a bit of back and forth here because we were trying yep. to, to coordinate schedules literally exactly 12 hours apart. So <laughs> it's not a totally impossible. It's just uh, right in the middle or right not in the middle of somebody's day. So yep. thank you. <laughs> right now it's what, midnight there? Yep. Yep. Just past midnight here. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always been interesting. I have to keep like three different time zones in my mind whenever scheduling. So I, what I do actually is I have my computer clock set to a different time zone than my Google calendar. And so whenever I'm comparing things like US hours, I look at my computer clock. And whenever I'm comparing to Asian hours, I, I look at Google calendar. That is brilliant. Actually, I kind of feel like I need to, I need to <laughs> adopt something like that because that would have really helped me, especially in our back and forth this last couple of weeks. So where are you based right now? Uh, I'm in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, that's right. Um, so how long have you been there? So I'm here about three quarters of the time, uh, and I have been for the last year or so. We've got offices in, in a bunch of different countries, and so I sort of fly back and forth between them, as well as you know, to conferences and, and, and things like that, but, uh, but spending sort of the bulk of my time now in Hong Kong. And um, where, did you, where were you based before that? So I was, in, uh, I was in the States before I was, so before going into crypto, I was working on Wall Street uh, oh, okay. for Jane Street Crypt Capital trading uh, international ETFs. Then I was in the Bay Area for a while and, uh, and now Hong Kong. Wow. So how long have you been in crypto? Like wh what year was it that you decided, hey, wait a minute, this whole Wall Street thing, I think I'm going to like yeah. abandon the fax machine and try email. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 2017. Uh, so right when things were starting to go crazy, uh, you know, in, in crypto land, right when market cap was was skyrocketing, volumes were running up, and, you know, you went from no one talking about Bitcoin to every single conversation in, in the country being about Bitcoin in, in like a three-month period. Yeah, I remember that. I remember just sitting in a random... Uh restaurant kind of beachside in Santa Monica. I was, I'd been at a conference, but the conference was like in San Jose or something. It's far away. It wasn't like I was yeah. outside the conference, you know, I was at a random place and I sit, I'm sitting there having a glass of wine, decompressing. And who, what do I overhear in the next table? People talking about Bitcoin, you know, the next night went to a restaurant, same thing. People talking about Bitcoin. I was like, I thought this was obscure. Oh, yeah. I thought I was on something that was kind of not very known, but you're right. It was like 2016, 17, things just like shot up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And so that's when you caught it, and that's when you decided to found Alameda Research? Yep, that's right. So I uh, left Jane Street and uh, started up Alameda Research, which is a quantitative trading firm in crypto. It does, you know, basically a combination of sort of arbitrage-based trading, quantitative strategies, OTC providing, um, and, uh, and sort of a bunch of other things, uh, you know, liquidity finding and other things tied in uh, with all of those. So in being based in Hong Kong, um, you know, I know a lot of our listeners are U.S. based just because we're U.S. based and just seems to be so far. That's uh, where a lot of our listeners are, although we have many people throughout the world as well. It's just yeah. that a lot of times our, our conversations are a bit U.S. markets focused. Um, yeah. And I think that's not just because we're, you know, so self-centered uh, being. In I mean, it's a world. big market. It's, you know, it's, it's really important market. to the world. Yeah. And, you know, also, we've it just seemed to seems like. 
the SEC is sort of the global watchdog and people perk yep. up their ears. They're like, what are they doing? Okay, maybe we should consider that, you know? So um, when there's, you know, the, the decree comes down from the SEC, people at least pay attention. They may not all want to, want to, you know, imitate that in their jurisdiction, but they do pay attention. So this like standard yep. is set. And so we often want to just talk about how does this apply to, you know, um, investors in the retail and accredited market in the U.S.? So can you speak a little bit to um, how FTX is available or not available to yep. uh, different forms of investors in the U.S.? Yep. So I, you know, first of all, I'll say this is, you know, this is an, an obviously an evolving thing and something that we're looking at and trying to get guidance. Um, you know, currently, so it's not available to, uh, you can go find the exact, you know, uh, sort of definitions of who it is and is not available to on the website. But basic answer is that it's, uh, not available to uh, individual accounts of Americans. And it's not available to uh, U.S. entities, although, uh, you know, sort of multinationals uh, are able to, or foreign entities are able to, to access it. So, um, the, so when you say access it as this exchange, yes. you're, you're listing um, essentially derivatives market assets and things like things right. of that nature that are a little bit more complicated than this, the average, let's securitize yep. something and give some shares out, right? Yep. Like, so um, because of these more complicated um, packages, essentially, that, you are, that you're yep. making available via crypto, um, is that part of why it's not available in the U.S. or is it that it can't be a U.S.-based um, so the, offering or yeah, so it's a good question, and the big thing here is is, is margin. So um, you know, by and large, you you can have sort of spot BTC USD markets in the United States. That's that's more or less kosher. Um, you know, as long as you're sort of complying with, with regulations and looking into getting uh, various you know money transmitter license and things like that. Um, the uh, you know, when you look at the longer tail of coins, it gets more complicated because of worries about, you know, what is a security. Um, but the, the big thing for derivatives is, is leverage. And, you know, then you're not talking about sort of SEC regulations, you're talking about CFTC regulations. Yep. You're talking about, you know, are th what are these things? Are they swaps? Are they futures? Are they interest rate products? Yeah. Um, you know, what's, what is the regulatory landscape for these? And, uh, you know, basic answer is that, uh, the CFTC is taking it slow. The CFTC, and this is why you see sort of all of the derivatives platforms in crypto basically outside of uh, the CME are not uh, US approved. And the reason is that uh, basically there doesn't really yet exist a full regulatory framework for margin trading in the United States. And similarly, you'll see that basically all spot exchanges ban margin trading, you know, even on spot contracts in the States. And, yeah. and the reason is that, you know, the CFTC, it's not so much that it's, you know, decided that, margin trading is evil or anything like that. It's that it, you know, they just don't to say about it, right? They're like, Oh gosh, you exactly. caught us we're in the bathroom. Hang on. Um, we'll yeah. be right back. And, right? and this is exactly, this is sort of one big difference between U S regulators and a lot of other jurisdictions is that, you know, in the U S it's very much a, like, you know, the, the regulators develop a, a framework for something and then you can do it. Whereas in a lot of other jurisdictions, it's sort of more of a blacklist type thing of, you know, uh, regulators will, go develop like things that they want to outlaw that they think are bad. Uh, but you know, there, there's sort of a little bit of a whitelist versus blacklist distinction here. And so, it, you know, it's not so much that the United States is, is really lagging on, on crypto regulation progress as that, you know, they take a, a way less favorable view towards uh, operating in a space where they haven't yet fully fleshed out the regulatory framework. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And so that is what has essentially led you to being based in Hong Kong right now, correct? Yeah, that's one of the big things is that, you know, it's very, very difficult to run any sort of margin trading crypto platform from the States, uh, you know, including a futures exchange. And so I think there are a few things going to that. And that's obviously one of the big things. Uh, the other big thing is just the customer base, you know, partially because of this, most of, of, of crypto flow comes from Asia. You know, it, it's primarily uh, coming from either multinationals or, or clearly out, out of, you know, whether it's China, Korea, Japan, uh, you know, whether it's Hong Kong, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, just a way more prevalent thing in Asia. And so in terms of being near where a customer base is, uh, you know, especially, and I think like, especially honestly, as you know, a firm that has a Western background, um, it's, it's really important for us to get interaction and FaceTime with our user base um, because we need to know what product they want. Absolutely. So, um, can you go through just for like the most in the most layman's terms, um, yep. 
what what exactly would be the process that an investor would go through if they were approved, if they were available, if this was available to them, what yep. is the process that they go through when they're on the FTX.com website? Yep. yep, it's pretty it's pretty clean. So uh, you know, you go to FTX.com and uh, basically, you know, you just click register, you can create an account, um, and then you can submit KYC information. Uh, for individuals, it's it's pretty quick. It should only take you a few minutes. Uh, it's basically, you know, you've got to take some selfies with your ID, uh, you know, write write some nice notes to us on a piece of paper, the, the, the <laughs> usual stuff. Right. Uh, and and that, that's all it takes to, to create an account at FTX. Um, and, you know, once you do that, uh, you should get, get, you know, approved within the day. Um, uh, or, or not approved if instead you upload just like a, you know, a picture of a banana or something like that. Um, <laughs> and w would you be surprised at some of the things that, that, that we see really? coming through? People like, I uh, do a face in a banana. Isn't that good enough? <laughs> right. It's, yeah. I mean, some things are clearly jokes. Like sometimes you just literally see someone like copy paste, like a GIF of someone, you know, bouncing on trampoline as their like ID photo or something. Uh, but, but other times, you know, we, we've seen a lot of people obviously trying to uh, create fake accounts, you know, whether this is, you know, the same picture gets uploaded for 10 consecutive accounts or, you know, really badly Photoshopped things or, or, or stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so people go through that process. They do KYC yep. and then what, what is available to them and what is the, yep. what's a common transaction? What's a common process that an individual investor, yep. like a normal listener at home, if they were able to engage in your yep. platform, what would they what do? What do they do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, you fund your account. Um, most of the trading here is, derivatives trading, which means that rather than, you know, uh, you know, depositing the token you want to sell and withdrawing the token you want to buy, you just deposit uh, sort of collateral, and then you can trade any of the products with it. So you can deposit, uh, you know, the, the standard collateral is US dollar stable coins. So uh, USDC, TUSD, and PAX are all accepted, uh, but you can also deposit Bitcoin or Tether. Okay. Um, and you can use any of those as collateral on the platform for any of the futures. And then once you have that, you can just go trade any of the futures on the platform. So we have, you know, futures on Bitcoin, ETH, uh, you know, EOS, LTC, so you know, the standard large cap tokens. But we also have futures on a bunch of things that, that you know, most platforms don't have. So we have futures on a bunch of exchange tokens, including BNB, Huobi token, OKB, Leo. Um, we have futures on a few indexes. So if, for instance, you wanted to get short uh, altcoins, you could, uh, you know, deposit collateral and then go short sell our altcoin index future. Um, and wow. you, know, you can just click around at the top to see all these. But yeah, it's kind of a cool product. And I think it fills uh, a niche. I'm surprised that no one else has done it. So I think it's a, it's a pretty useful product for a lot of things. You know, you could imagine, first of all, if you just think altcoins are you know, going to outperform Bitcoin, uh, the obvious thing is just get long an index of alt altcoins, short Bitcoin. Right. Um, rather than picking one altcoin and being exposed to, to its movement. Or conversely, if you think that, you know, you, you're a big fan of EOS, you think it's going to really outperform, you could, for instance, get long EOS and then hedge it by getting short the altcoin futures. Right. So that right. you're sort of, you know, you're not, you don't lose money if just like crypto as a whole goes down, or even if like BTC dominance goes up or anything, you're really betting on, you know, something against its reference class. Right. Um, so we have, you know, we have index futures on altcoins, mid cap tokens, and shit coins. <laughs> um and uh so the last one, that term too i was like waiting oh, yeah. for that to come out i was like is he gonna say it i'm so glad <laughs> oh you got it no choice there it that was i mean that was you know we sort of rushed that product to the market just for the for the name for no uh, yeah right <laughs> isn't um, our shitcoins index futures <laughs> oh yeah um but it's an important thing because you know shitcoins are an important part of crypto and it's yeah. really hard to trade them efficiently right now like first of all you can't get leverage on any of them so you can't short sell them second of all a lot of them you know the spreads are a percent wide so right. you're going to lose a lot trading them you have to be on the right platforms you can't get much size off it it's just a big a big pain and obviously you have to go through that if you want you know trade a particular one but if instead you just want to generally get exposed to uh you know to to that sector uh, you know, the, the shitcoin perpetual features are super liquid. You can get, you know, uh, millions of dollars off in them if you want to. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you could get a hundred X long or short, uh, them. So. Yeah, that's incredible. I love the, the idea of hundred X long or short on this is like, that's actually, it seems to be, that's really what the crypto market is for right yeah. now is. Oh, absolutely. Um, so how did you get into this? I mean, I know you were working on wall street before. Is that what you studied in school? What did you, what was yeah. your. Were you not like generous at all? Were you like always numbers, right. numbers, 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 numbers? 
Sort of. So I was, I did uh, <laughs> physics technically. Uh, okay. I, I sort of a bullshit physics degree. And yeah, I, I took like not very many classes. I, I, I realized about halfway through college, I probably didn't want to be a physicist. <laughs> and so, you know, sort of pivoted away from, from that, took just a, a smattering of classes in my last few years. Um, didn't really want to, you know, know what I, I wanted to do with my life. Interned at Jane Street. Uh, okay, you know, whoever class. knows what they want to do with their life. Yeah, per- I mean, period. Uh, like, kind of any time, but especially in your 20s. Like, is, how on earth is that a time where you're supposed yeah. to make really important decisions? Like, oh, there's yeah. no, the only decision in one's 20s is really like tequila or vodka. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, anyway, I, 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 I certainly knew. I thought I knew what I wanted, but I, I was wrong. I, I had no idea. And yeah. sort of realized that halfway through college, I uh, tried out a bunch of things, most of which just didn't really excite me. And then, uh, and then I uh, interned at Jane Street, and and I really liked it. Um, so I did that, you know, after my junior year, and then just went back uh, to work full time after I graduated. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I basically, I uh, you know, worked on Wall Street, then trading international ETFs for uh, about three years. Um, and so those are those are basically U.S. listed you know ETFs that are baskets on foreign stocks. Right. Um, and so it might be, you know, a U.S. ETF that has, uh, you know, Honda and, and uh, you know, Toyota and, and sort of other large cap Japanese companies or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, was there until 2017. And, and sort of, as you said, you know, who, whoever knows exactly what they want to do with their life. And I think in, in the end, that's sort of what I decided was I, I was really happy at Jane Street. Um, They're really good to me. I, I really liked it. But there's a lot of things I want to try with my life. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know what they all are. I, I, I had a lot of ideas. I didn't know which was going to pan out. And it was sort of an hour and other thing. Like, you know, it, it sort of felt to me like, uh, you know, that, that was the time to decide whether I was just going to make my lifetime career there at Jane Street or whether I was going to try out a bunch of shit. And it was a tough call. I ended up, I didn't quite flip a coin, but I came close. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but in the end I left. Um, and, uh, I, you know, then, uh, you know, afterwards started up Alameda Research. So what's the biggest thing you feel like you've learned from like a philosophical standpoint, as well as, you know, a, just a professional yeah. standpoint, what's the biggest thing you've learned by taking this leap? I think that I've learned a lot of uh, a, a lot of things. I think maybe some of the biggest things, one is management. Like I, you know, I managed like two people or something prior to this, but not, not a whole company. And, and they're also sort of, you know, as a, a position where I wasn't, I was obviously, you know, it's my job to help them do as well as possible, but I, I wasn't responsible for them in that. It's not like if they did poorly, that was going to ruin my life. And if they did well, that was going to be the best thing ever. It was just, you know, as their mentor, you know, for some of the pe- people, uh, you know, younger people on my desk, some of the interns. Um, and I'd never been put in a position before of like, I have to make hiring and firing decisions and it's really important I get that right. And that and interdependence I, too, right? Like you have to make sure exactly. that you offer the right thing to the right person and incentivize them to stay, but also you have to be willing to like cut the wrong person off and for the better exactly. of the whole. And, you know, you'll be shocked to hear that that's not something that I did right the first time. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's just classic mistakes, right? Like not firing soon enough because it really fucking sucks to fire someone. Like, yeah. uh, you know, and and maybe, maybe I, I, another thing which I think is just less obvious, it's not, it's not shocking, but I think it, it's really true, and I underestimate this, is the importance of, of hiring people who are a good fit for yeah. the very, for the culture. And, the culture. you know, I think one of the mistakes I made was like, you know, hiring people who were brilliant, hardworking, like uh, had the right skills. On but paper. Just, Exactly. And would be great at a lot of jobs, but they just like, they didn't like the way that our company worked, you know, like yeah. they like, you know, yeah. and a classic thing is like, you know, def- if you look at developers, their surface spectrum from like, you know, very get the product out focused. Like my, I care about the product, the coding is a means to get there. And, you know, I'm, I, the, the goal of the code is, 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 is to be sort of functional versus like the, the code is the goal. Right. And you know, right. my goal is to write the most beautiful code I can. And if it's something less than that, like my highest goal is to keep performing that till it's right. right. And it's not like one of those is, is don't ship, don't ship yet. It's not good right. enough. Like no, exactly. No, no. If you're proud of what you ship the first time, you ship too late, right? Right, exactly. And and I think this is also you know, it's just, it depends on the industry you're in, right? And like if what you're building, if your core product is software, right, then it it makes a lot more sense. If like you're only going to make 
you know, your product's only going to do well if the software is better than all other software. And, it, right. and that, like, that's really what people are interfacing with. Whereas for us, if, you know, if you're creating a consumer application, like, you know, the software is sort of the thing that you do to create that, but it's not the product itself. And so, you know, that's sort of an example of a spectrum where, uh, yeah, I really didn't appreciate this at the beginning, but it's important to hire people who are on, on the same side of it as your company is. Yeah, you absolutely. They're not going to be happy. They're not going to be able to work hard. There's going to be a lot of tension, a lot of arguments over things that you you think are stupid and they think are stupid, but you disagree on what the stupid thing and is. You can't, and uh, you can't always be fighting that fight. It's like, I'm sorry, I, I exactly. don't have time to come in and, and fight you on the philo- philosophy of how exactly. we're going to move forward. We're just moving forward this way and this isn't a good fit. You know, it's, it can yeah. be tough. Yeah, I found that exactly. you, can, you can train pretty much anything into a person. A person can learn a lot of things. Wait, they can, yeah. they can astound you with how fast that a quick study can pick something up. The things they yeah. cannot pick up that you have to make sure are just inherently there is a culture fit. And for me, it's integrity. Like if someone doesn't have yeah. kind of honesty, integrity, the ability to just own their own shit, that you can't train that in. Like that's just, that's either in them or not, you know? So either they fit yeah. because they can take responsibility and they can do those things or they just don't fit. And, you know, I've, I do, um, do not have children, and I have often yeah. reminded people that have worked for me and colleagues of mine, like, I don't have kids for a reason. If you didn't know that already on your own, you have bigger problems yeah. than this one mistake. <laughs> I'm not here to check your work. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it totally makes sense. And, and, you know, there's being able to say to someone, look, you're a great person. You're, you're smart. You're a hard worker. This isn't the right place for you. Right. So I'm not going to give you an offer. Or I'm going to fire you. But but this really isn't a reflection on me thinking you're bad or anything like that. This is just like, I've seen this before. I know how this is going to go. In two months, you're going to be unhappy. And and we're not going to get unhappy. good work out of you and you're not going to get a good fit out exactly. of that. So. Unhappy employees are never good. It's just yeah. like, you know, so, so that, that's, you know, one sort of, you know, lesson I learned. And, you know, I, I think another thing that, that I had to deal with the first time is like, what if something bad happens and, it's ultimately your responsibility. And what I mean by that is like, you know, when I sort of at Jane Street, like I tried to take responsibility for, you know, as much as I could and and do the right thing. But, you know, ultimately there are a lot of people at the company and also a lot more senior than me who made the ultimate calls on a lot of things. And so, you know, I would do the best I could. And, you know, there are times where I basically say, look, here's a deal. You know, you, you can make this call if you want. Um, Whereas, you know, here it's, you know, I absolutely love, you know, employees to solve everything. They do solve a lot of things, but there's sometimes where like, ultimately, like I, you know, I, it's sort of my responsibility to make sure that a thing goes well, whatever that means. Even if I thought it was someone else's responsibility, even if it seems stupid or unfair, those are sort of meaningless concepts. Like, you know, I, you know, you're sitting there complaining, oh man, it's so unfair that like, I have to deal with this shit. So annoying. Like the world's being unfair, like some employees and doing the right thing. And meanwhile, the consumers of your product are like, this website doesn't load. Yeah. And they they really don't care what you're complaining. Like that really doesn't matter to them. Right. They're not going to be like, oh no. I'm not caring. You know, it's like, is you, you have to be like, I'm the voice right now. Sorry. Exactly. They're not going to be like, oh, don't worry. I get it. Comcast is really difficult to deal with, right? They're going to be like, no, I want, I want to access the website. And it doesn't matter how, how difficult Comcast is. You know, we have yeah. to find a way to route around that. And, you know, I, and so I think that was sort of another thing that I've, you know, spent time working on is like a lot of strategies to troubleshoot problems when the straightforward approach doesn't work. Yeah. Because, you know, my job isn't just to put in a good faith attempt to get things to work. My job is to make sure that they do work. Right. Right. It's funny because like you've started really like very much in your own wheelhouse going, okay, we're going to, we're just going to take the derivatives markets markets and cram it together with crypto and just go do this. And then you realize, oh my God, there's this whole new, there's, there are multiple different skill sets that I have to now like acquire and acquire. And it's like, it's almost like now the the core of, of what you started is, is like in the back of your head. You're like, yeah, I know that in the, like the back of my, you know, like the back of my hand, no problem. But everything else that I have to learn to execute on this, to lead and to get, you know, everybody involved and everything else, everyone on the same page, yep. higher and higher, that's really becomes the next yeah, thing. Yeah, that's process. absolutely right. Yeah. I love that about the entrepreneurial process though, is like, you know, if you think that you've got this all handled, you're basically probably about to die in the water. Maybe it's, <laughs> it, yeah. it changes so fast that if you're not exactly. really, really agile, you're just not going to make it, especially in the crypto space. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right.
So did you take any classes in college that prepared you at all for these new challenges? I mean, leadership or human skill, people skills, uh, group dynamics, anything like that that ever came across? Are you pulling from anything in your past that is like helping you? Or are you just like, I'm going to read another management book and I'm going to keep trying? Like, it's, Yeah, the answer is surprisingly close to no. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not quite exactly no. Uh, you know, I did some sort of... Uh, competitions in college at that and they're fun they also sort of help me uh you know explore with building a thing like from scratch and, and you know so it's not like nothing was helpful but but actually surprisingly little was like there's you know it it, it, it there really aren't classes that prepare you for this yeah. and you know both in terms of the you know management uh but but also just in terms of the subject matter it turns out like finance classes don't teach you about quant trading and, <laughs> Uh, neither do economics classes. So yeah, right. Um, you know, yeah. yeah, it's all like it's all just kind of throw throw you into the uh, into the fire and see if you can if you can handle That's it. That's right. That's great. Well, um, let's see. I had another question just about your consumers. I mean, how is it that how are you? Do you feel like you have a good feedback loop with your consumers, with your actual customers? And it, like, how does yeah. that get fostered for you? It sounds like you've got a really close eye on what they need, and the in between is the management part. But you've got a really direct line with your customers. How does that work for you? Yeah. Yeah, so we we get a lot of feedback. Um, we have you know thousands of people in WeChat groups uh, for Chinese language support. We have thousands of people in a Telegram group. Uh, we have people will tweet at me when they don't like a feature. Uh, people DM me on Twitter. I get LinkedIn messages, uh, alternately asking for jobs and asking me to change something about FTX. Like you know, there's a, people people are quite creative uh, and <laughs> uh, about contacting us, uh, and so. We get, we get a ton of feedback and, you know, one sort of challenge that we go through is how do we synthesize it, especially when it's contradictory. Yeah. You know, especially right. when like one person saying one thing, another person's asking for the exact opposite and, you know, someone's going to be pissed no matter what, but, you know, we have to decide what to do. And, you know, what we try and do is rather than literally say, okay, we have to decide between what person A and person B asked for is say like, what does person A actually want? Like what's, what's the core feature they want? What's their complaint about the current? Uh, version of it, what does person B want? And is there some structure that has both those properties, even if it's not what either of them actually proposed? Right. And so we try to do that, but sometimes we fail. And if you can't do that, then that sucks. And sort of, you know, you're left just having to make a judgment call about which is the least bad. And <laughs> uh, sometimes we, we make that call wrong and we hear very quickly. Um, the, <laughs> one, one, one example of this is it turns out that and this is something that I, I did not realize was going to be true. Um, people really care how so when when you trade on on FTX, obviously you'll like have you know some profit or loss from your trading, and you know your account balances will change. Um, in addition to that, people want the website to tell them how much money they've made. So they want you know there to be a right. field which is like your P and L, um, right. but. There are a lot of ways to define PL. And to give you, you know, a few different examples of that, like, you know, should this be PL on your recent trading, on every trade you've ever done, on your current open position? What should it mark to? Like, how should, you know, how should it distinguish between spot and futures markets? Should it include fees? How about funding rates? There's there's a lot of fiddly questions here right. about exactly what PL means. If you do percentage PL, it's even trickier because what's your denominator? Right? If you make two thousand dollars. It's out of what? Out of the amount of collateral you had in your account, out of the size of your position, the amount of collateral necessary for your position. Like, you know. Yeah, what metric does the consumer even really want to be monitoring? And what are you supposed to make? You know, how do you even design that to, right. to bring that front and for, foremost like, to, the, to their exactly. mind, right? And so we've played around with a few different versions and we got really, really negative feedback when we chose the wrong ones. Uh, and this, I was not, not expecting this, but I think the angriest we've ever seen our user base was when uh, we had uh, like one particular set of p &L calculations that didn't include the ones people wanted. <laughs> and, uh, and so we sort of had to do an emergency, er, like an emergency patch to roll out some new calculations. Um, and to be clear, none of this was changing the amount of money that People actually made none of this. Right, was changing. it was just changing what they believed, what they saw. What right, they saw exactly. Like that, right. Yeah, exactly. And so you know that that was sort of an example of like, boy, did we get a lot of consumer feedback on that really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's insane. I mean, it sounds like you've got your hands really full with this, and this is yeah. uh, definitely taken off very quickly. Uh, and it's, do you have any more plans for expansion? Like, what's on the horizon? Do we have any future yeah. talk of the futures market? 
-hmm. Yeah, a bunch of things. So, uh, and you know, some of these we'll see which come to fruition, but I think, you know, on the docket right now are um, launching some more features, so some more indexes, some altcoin against Bitcoin features, more spot markets, bigger things. We're probably going to launch options sometime soon. Um, and then after that, we're going to look into uh, potentially prediction markets, uh, potentially hash rate features, Bitcoin dominance features. Um, so these are all things that, that we're still sort of churning about how we would do trying to understand, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the regulatory frameworks for them, the demand for them, what product exactly people want. Um, but that's sort of on a product side, what we have, and then sort of on, on usage side, um, mobile apps and uh, are, are probably the biggest thing that we're working through. Um, outside of that, we just released a uh, troll box today. So you can now chat. It's just a, a chat room on, on the website. And then one last kind of interesting thing that we're working through is um, FTX is sometimes slow when accessed from mainland China. Uh, because of firewalls. Uh, and this is obviously a sensitive uh, you know, thing to, to work with. And so we're currently doing a lot of research, uh, doing research and also uh, starting on some, what we think are, but are not sure are gonna be solutions for this, uh, to have basically uh, you know, data hosted locally in China for Chinese users to make the, the product more responsive. Wow, that's incredible. So, you know, I, I'm, you mentioned very quickly hash rate futures. Now that sounds like yeah. something that they're, talk about being way ahead of regulatory framework. I don't think there's ever been an option for people to engage in a market where you can basically place your bets on technology advancement directly. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, this is, it's kind of a cool product. It's a product obviously that miners have a lot of interest in among other things. Of course. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, Again, there's some uh, some definitional issues here about exactly what this product should be, whether it should uh, you know, so one interesting thing is that because of difficulty adjustments, um, uh, you know block time basically reverts every two weeks. And so there's a question of you know whether or not you want to be adjusting by that, and, you know and a few other things, but like you know by and large, I think that uh, it's it's a product that we've seen a bunch of excitement for, and hopefully we'll launch it within the next couple months. So, oh my God, a couple months—that's amazing! You guys are going at light speed. That is wonderful. Well, Sam, okay. I am so grateful that you took the time to talk to us about this. This is really cool. I mean, not just that running a company is its own huge <laughs> monster, but the type of company that you're running and where you're running it from and what you're, I mean, in a way you're not waiting, but it'll be really nice when the CFTC kind of figures out what they want to say about this and what they're going to allow yep. U.S. investors to even engage in. But in the meantime, you're really, you've got a, you've got a lot going on in Asia. This yep. is incredible. Yep, it's very do. exciting. Thank you so much for telling me about it. And um, I don't know. I mean, do you have any any closing things that you want to make sure we touch on before you go? Do you have any announcements? Um, how? And we're gonna have all of your links where people can find you, so yep. they can, of course, awesome. give you any of their feedback, yep. <laughs> their opinions, yep. or their feedback, as Hannah Gadsby would say. Um, so yeah, do you have anything else that you would like to add before we sign off here? Yeah, just obviously, you know, we'd love users to try out the platform, and we'd love to hear your feedback. It's super helpful. You know, I make fun of it sometimes, but it really does make the, the product better. It's how we know what people like and what they don't like. Um, and I, uh, you know, love for FTX to be the product that works, uh, you know, that works for you and has what you want. So absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sam. It's been a total pleasure talking with you. And I appreciate you staying up until nearly one in the morning to talk. Uh, no to me. problem. Um, it's, it's great that we finally connected. And I wish you all the best with FTX. This is very exciting. And thank I can't you. wait. If you'd like to come back on the show after a few more things have been released, I yep. would love to interview you more in depth about especially hash rate futures. That sounds really cool. So thanks again. Um, and this is Monica Profit and Sam Bankman Fried. And we're signing off on the new trust economy. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.